morning, everybody. It's a great day, beautiful opportunity for us to be able to gather here this morning, and I trust that you are excited about being here and encouraged by the Word is our, our hope and our goal. So we're going to press forward with that. Uh, we do have a couple of announcements that I want to make. First of all, I want to make sure uh, that everyone knows we have a Vacation Bible School planned August the 3rd, 4th, and 5th, and so we're not very far out from that. If you are interested in helping with Vacation Bible School at any level, uh, please plan on meeting today after services in our fellowship hall. Ooh, got a hot mic going on here. Hot mic, hot mic. Uh, in the fellowship hall, if, uh, if you don't know where that is, you can follow these steps down and uh, walk the, the labyrinth corridor to that section. You'll find the fellowship hall. Uh, so all of the crazy people will be gathering at the fellowship hall immediately after services this morning. Our Vacation Bible School, to put it on your calendars, August 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And as, as kind of a unique opportunity this year, each evening before the start of Bible School at 530 there's going to be a meal offered. So uh, we'll kind of cut out the idea of doing the, the snack time, refreshment time. We'll do a meal at the first. So if you're interested in helping in any way, please gather in the fellowship hall immediately after services this morning for a brief meeting. And we appreciate that. All right, let's go uh, with, if you could click on the slide for me there. Uh, yes, first of all, I want to make sure if you've not done this, go to our website, unioncitycc.org. You'll find that link that's there at the top of the page that allows you to click on it and fill out a, a brief little form. You can put your information there. That way we know that you are in attendance, whether you're watching online or you're live in the assembly. We appreciate that information. It helps us keep track of a lot of things with regard to attendance makes it a lot easier for us. So thank you for doing that. If you have a prayer request you'd like to add to that, uh, please do so. There's a comment portion in that form. You can fill that out. If you have a change of address or information, contact information, any of that sort of stuff, please include that. We do not share that. We keep that here in the office. And uh, the only time anything like that is ever shared is with your explicit permission. We don't make those decisions. So if you entrust us with your info, we try to keep that very close. But we do appreciate having it. it helps us keep in communication with you with regard to important program uh, information or prayer needs and things of that nature. If you are not on our call list, which we only use every uh, so often, it's, in, it's uh, called One Call Now. If you're not on that list and would like to, to be added, please include your phone number on that form and we will add you to our call list. Don't use it very often, but there are times when it's important to get information out and we will use it then. Uh, we just try not to bomb you with a lot of stuff. Or if you're not on our email list and would like to receive updates, uh, information about programming, information about prayer concerns, or other things pertinent to the church, please include your email and we will include you in our email list as well. It's not, it's an undisclosed list. It's not open for everyone to see the email, so uh, hopefully you won't get spammed. So uh, we appreciate that information. All right. A couple of things that we need to cover with regard to uh, other uh, changing announcements really quickly. Uh, the Blast Christian Academy, we've been speaking about. The church is, is uh, more or less hosting. We're providing space for this new Christian Academy here, which is K now through third grade. So we've had interest being shown in students all the way up through the third grade. And uh, by my experience, that would be, I think I was 12 in the third grade. So pretty good age span there. So kindergarten garden up through the third grade. Uh, a lot of things are happening there. If you're interested or would like information on the Blast Christian Academy, it'll be a school that's based in instruction on biblical values and it'll be here in our building this fall. If you're interested in this, please speak with uh, Melinda Harris or Stuart Harris and I'm sure that they would be thrilled to be able to provide you with information about that school. You may not have a student in that age range, but you might know someone who does and you may know know someone who has um, a desire to place their child in a Christian environment for instruction and uh, with some, some trusted instructors, uh, if, if you would let them know and give them contact information, I'm sure that would be very appreciated and that will help us um, to, to help them with their first year to be a success and that's really the goal. So let's uh, pray about this and encourage and promote other uh, opportunities for people to be involved and, and that'll be a great blessing. 
Tomorrow night, 6.30, is kind of the reset opportunity for our Builders for Christ local area men's fellowship among our congregations. And we will be in Ravenna. It's on US 52 headed toward Estill County. And uh, there is a rain plan. If weather is not great, we're going to be going to the River Drive Christian Church, which is there in Ravenna. It's very close. But the plan is now to use the park in Ravenna for our gathering. This is for men only. It's at 6.30 is when the meal begins. It's a cookout style meal. And uh, there'll be live music. There'll be a speaker. We're just encouraging fellows to bring lawn chairs if you're planning on attending. That way, uh, there'll definitely be enough seating and uh, won't have any issues there. So if you have questions about that, please speak with me this morning and I'll do my best to give you that information so that you can prepare and be ready for that fellowship. Also, coming up July the 11th, which is only a couple Sundays away, we're going to be hosting Mark Bishop in concert. Last year, because of the pandemic, we were not able to have Mark in concert, but uh, he will be here for us in uh, July, just a couple weeks from now. If you've never been to a Mark Bishop concert, I would encourage you to consider to do that. It's during our Sunday uh, evening time, so it doesn't uh, make any issues for us on Sunday morning. It's at 6 o'clock that Sunday night, and we'll have folks from uh, traveling from all around, actually, that come in for Mark Bishop. Mark is a Grammy-nominated uh, artist, and he has a, a very good library of music that he brings. It's always a very fast-paced, kind of enjoyable night. So I encourage you to be here and be a part of this. Invite guests. There's no cost for this. We don't charge a ticket price. This is on a free will offering basis. So we just encourage you to uh, consider coming and inviting guests. Enjoy that concert. And then if you want to give to help Mark and, and kind of defraying those costs, that's wonderful. I know he appreciates that. So July the 11th at 6 o'clock here at the church building. And we just encourage you to kind of spread the news about that. All right. We do have some prayer requests that we want to make known. There are several. Uh, we have some that are kind of an ongoing request that we've had on uh, Vaughn. We're continuing to pray for her. She continues to regain her strength for Erlene as well, uh, wanting to uh, continue to pray for her. But we also have some additional prayer requests that have been added. Uh, Gary Puckett has been added. Danny Barnett has been added. Danny suffered a, a fall this past week, several broken bones. Um, he, was, he was working on a ladder, fell from the ladder, uh, went to the hospital, and as a result of treating him for those injuries, they found a mass on his stomach. So we're just encouraging you to please uh, pray for Danny and for his wife. Um, they are uh, neighbors of uh, the, the Richardsons, so I encourage you to, to pray for them. Uh, little Ava Smith, we sent out an email about this. Uh, Ava is, is a very young child, and uh, Lisa Hart has been babysitting her and she ended up with botulism uh, some way or another and has been in the hospital to be treated for this and it's a difficult circumstance, uh, circumstance because she is so tiny um, the IVs didn't work like they typically would so they have to do IVs in her head and just she's just a little tiny thing and I know the parents are deeply concerned about this and they're just requesting prayer support from everywhere so please pray for little Ava we appreciate that um, also a friend of, of ours uh, has a daughter who has been serving as a missionary in City Soleil, Haiti. And uh, if you're aware or familiar at all with Haiti, you know that it is a pretty tumultuous um, circumstance in terms of government structure, and there's a lot of unrest, a, a tremendous amount of need. And um, we are requesting prayer for her. Alicia Rose is her name. She is serving as a missionary there, but because of everything that's been going on, heightened violence, a lot of gang problems, uh, some very recent violence where there were some shootings, some young children were killed. Uh, they have pretty much locked the area down and she's not able to do what they typically would do. She is coming home stateside uh, very soon, but we're praying uh, for her safety in the meanwhile and for the folks there in Haiti. Uh, heartbreaking circumstance. So please pray for Alicia and for her uh, family. Um, members of a, of a neighboring church. Also for the Tom McMullen family, we have been praying for Tom who is suffering from some serious complications from COVID and he passed away this past week. So I encourage you to please pray for uh, the McMullen family in their time of loss. Again, if you have a prayer request,
request, please submit that. Let me know. Uh, it's best in writing, or if you could fill it out, put it on the form, that's even better. That gives us opportunity to uh, make sure I've got all the information correct, and we will pass that information on for others to be in prayer about it as well. Uh, before we have our um, opening prayer, we're going to have an opening scripture this morning, and I'll have Stuart come and lead us in that time. Opening scripture this morning comes from Psalm 8, verses 1 through 4. It reads, O Lord, O Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again for blessing us with an opportunity to gather and meet and to learn about you. Uh, we pray for all those prayer requests mentioned this morning, each and every one of those families, and uh, just have your healing hand on them, um, and pray that your will will be done in each one of those situations. Pray that you will uh, be with each and every one of us, help us to learn more about you today, and take that with us through the week and share it with others, Lord. Uh, we love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We are in the final sermon of this series. It's been two months worth of covering uh, topics that I hope have been challenging to you and perhaps encouraging or equipping to you as well. Today I want to try and put a bow on things by offering an opportunity for a little bit of reflection and a little bit of an opportunity for some encouragement I hope as well. So before we get into that, I just want to ask if you would to bow your heads with me. We'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get into our message for today. Let's pray together. Father, again, we give praise to you for who you are. You are deserving serving of our praise, not for what you do, but for who you are. You have revealed to us so much in your word with regard to who you are, your character, your nature. You've shown us in the created things around us the, the abundance of, of ability that you have just in speaking into being. And then we consider the unique creation of mankind, how you sculpted and formed us, how you breathed into that first man, the breath of life and how, as Scripture said, he became a living being. How you've formed the, the woman from man to be able to be a, a, suit, a suitable helpmate, someone who is compatible and complementary and able to bring perspectives and uh, abilities unique. And together, the impact that's created in your creation. We thank you, Father, for the pr privilege you've given us in faith to agree with you to submit to the terms you've established, which are unchanging, they're consistent, they are reasonable, they are attainable. And in the areas, in the places, in those uh, circumstances in our life where we cannot make a difference for ourselves spiritually, where we cannot bring forgiveness by our own actions or righteousness because it fails and falls short, you've acted in the most wonderful of ways in what we refer to as grace. We thank you, Lord, for that abundant grace. We thank you for the privilege it gives us to stand now clean and new and refreshed, to have a place of service, to have a place of belonging, to be adopted by you into your family, to have a new name, a, a hope of uh, eternity with you. We pray that you'd help us in the meanwhile to do the best we can with the resources entrusted to our care so that our service and our living is suited to bring you honor. May you bless our efforts as we pray together in Jesus' name, amen. We have been looking into the simple text in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, which says, Train up a child in the way he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We've established very solidly, I think very quickly into this series, that this is not a promise that everything's going to work out as far as your children are concerned. This is not God saying, if you have them in church, eventually, sooner or later, they're going to come back to church if they wander and go astray. That is not the promise being afforded here. It instead is a challenge for parents, especially, to consider the unique created traits of their child, their, their bents, their interests, their unique skills, and to help them find a place where they can use these in a fitting, honorable way within the kingdom. 
when you understand that about the child and you're able to offer instruction and guidance and, and leading to the child in faith with those perspectives in mind, they come to a place of satisfaction and they come to a place of, of fulfillment and they can find their purpose. And this is what the world longs for. There's a tremendous void created there outside Christ and they are looking to fill that void to find purpose and meaning in their life and they will fill the void with whatever they think fits but the Bible tells us there is a way which seems right to man and the end leads to death. So even in our best reasoning, in our search for hope and meaning and purpose, sometimes we fail and fall short. And that's where we need the message of Christ to provide a defining reflection, uh, an aha moment for us, because it helps us realize our value as a created being, created in the image of God, worthy of redemption through the blood of Christ. God valued us enough. He, he was willing to pay that cost, that price for us to redeem us, and as such has placed us in his family to serve, to be able to have a place of purpose and meaning and, and practical uh, abilities that can be used to benefit the kingdom. Apart from Christ, we don't come to that understanding. So this places a challenge on us. As mature Christian adults, we have the challenge of going and sharing the hope of Christ with others. In that sense, we are training up others to recognize their need for Christ, their, their value in Christ. They're not living up to that value or not receiving the full benefit of that value outside Christ, the, the deficit that's there, and the tremendous jeopardy that's there for them eternally, but helping them understand their value in Christ and then leading them bringing them to a point of obedient faith, if at all possible. As a parent, as a mentor, a grandparent, a teacher, someone as a mature Christian adult in the lives of young people, we have the opportunity to pour resources and effort into them so they can recognize their need for Christ. Going out into this world is harsh. It's difficult. There's a lot of challenges. It's been that way for years and years and years. It's not getting any easier. And we don't want to throw them to the wolves. We want to be able to help equip and train them with an understanding of their faith so that they can defend their faith, so that they can share their faith and stand even in the most difficult of circumstances. That's our hope and goal. That's a big task. But it's not impossible. And how do I know that? Because it's an expectation God has placed on us and he puts no unreasonable expectation upon us. That's one of the benefits of being in the church as well, because we can pool resources and abilities. We can hone one another. We can learn from one another. We can grow when we fail. We can shore one another up, hold one another accountable. Those are great elements of being involved in the body of Christ, and they help to compel us to go out and be as effective as we can as an ambassador for Christ, sharing the message of Christ. In the heart of this, the family... You see, God formed the church from the model of the family, not the other way around. The family came first. God created the man and the woman. He created the opportunity and, and even gave them the, the command to go and be fruitful and to populate, to, to multiply, as he said. That was a command given in the earliest part of Genesis. It's a command given to Noah and his family following the flood. It was a command given to Abraham. It's a command that keeps going again and again and again throughout the Old Testament and comes into the New Testament. And it gives us a little bit of a perspective of the value of family and the impact a family can make in a community in a culture so desperate to find a place of belonging. Now, I know many of us come from different experiences. We have all kinds of different things that we've, we've known in life. Perhaps for some of us, we've been blessed with godly parents, and we had a wonderful upbringing. Um, I can say that. Some of you perhaps didn't have that experience. Here's what we know. Everybody has the right now. 
Every one of us has an opportunity today to make that determined choice, that decision, that based on past experience, good or bad, based on what we know today with regard to Christ, that we can drive a stake in the ground and say, I am going from this day forward to serve Christ with my fullest ability. I'm going to do everything within my ability and resources to help others see their need for Christ. The young people within my scope of influence, I'm going to work with them to show Christ to them and teach and instruct them and lead them so they'll know what appropriate Christian behavior is and how it fits in this culture, how to defend their faith in a, in a world that comes against it. I'm going to do my best in my interaction with other adults to show honor to the Lord Jesus first. I'm going to serve in such a way that it recognizes that I'm not working for my boss, I'm serving the Lord Jesus and I'm giving honor to God through what I'm doing. So I'm going to do my best in every area so that Christ will shine. The difference Christ makes will be shown. This is the impression that I want to challenge us all to take hold of today. I want to consider a couple things as, as we approach this. And I want to go back to a text that's probably very familiar to, to all of us. It's a text we often refer to as the account of the prodigal son. I don't want to do the entire prodigal son story, but I want to just recap really quickly what's happened here. A father who was of some substance and means had two sons. The youngest of the sons came to him at a certain age in his life and said, give me my inheritance, cut me loose, let me go. That was completely outside protocol, completely out of cultural norms, but the father, in a sense of, of love for his son, gave his son his inheritance and set him free, and he took off. He went to a foreign place, and the Bible said that he lived a very immoral life, lost everything that he had, spent everything he had on his immorality, and found himself as a, as a Jewish young man longing for the food that he was feeding to another man's pigs. So he was living in an environment that would have made him unclean in his own religious upbringing. He didn't have substance to care for him. He had no place to stay. He had no food to sustain him. And he was, he was hungry enough, if given the opportunity, he would have eaten the hog slop, but he didn't even have that opportunity. And the Bible says he came to his senses. He realized who he was, and he realized where he was, and he said, am, am I so bad off that I can't return to my father and say to him, I'll serve you. I'm not worthy to be accepted as a son. Just take me as a servant, and I will serve you, because even my father's servants are treated better than this. And so he did the best he could to gather up. He went back to his father in his humility, in his repentance, in his brokenness, and his sorrow. The father, seeing him at a distance, came to receive him, cleans his son up, dresses him appropriately as a son, didn't take him as a servant. He received him as a son, gave him uh, the, the means that were necessary to be able to be accepted fully as a son again and the benefits that come along with it. And they were going to have a celebration. And it's at this point we pick up in the text in Luke chapter 15, verses 25 and following, where the Bible says in, in killing this calf and having this barbecue, you could say, this, this big party to welcome the son back, the older son doesn't go into the party. He's, he's upset. And he comes back to the father and he, he pleads his own case. Let's look here. It says the older son was in the field. When he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He summoned one of the servants, began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed a fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he became angry, was not willing to go in. His father came out and began pleading with him. That's the second time in the text we read of the father coming out. Wants to receive the repentant son who had left in immorality, came back humbly broken. And secondly, to come to receive the second son and to plead with him and reason with him. Scripture said he came out and began pleading with him. But he answered, said to his father, look, for so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a commandment of yours. And yet you've never given me a young goat so I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours comes who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you've always been with me and all I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. 
There's a phrase there, as I was reading this text earlier this week, once again, that just jumped off the page that I had not really paid attention to before. The first son who squandered his inheritance, shamed the family name, went to a foreign country, lived in ways completely outside their faith. When he came back, the father, now reasoning with his older brother, used a phrase. He said, your brother was dead, but he has begun to live. He's acknowledging something that's happened here, and it's not finished. It's not a completed work. You know, here's the thing with parenting. <laughs> There's no perfect parents. And in spite of what we might think of our kids, there is no perfect kid. It's just not, it doesn't happen, okay? Well, maybe there's one perfect kid, but my mother's not here to brag, so. <laughs> I'll let you feel that out. We had, a, we had a whole passel of kids in the family, but <sighs> mom knows who I'm talking about. There's no perfect kid. There's no perfect parents. Mistakes happen. Mistakes are made. Decisions are made. Free will intervenes. Anger intervenes. Sometimes things are done perfect, and the result just isn't what should be. Some things are not done perfect, and the result turns out better than we hoped. That's life. The thing that brings the measuring difference here is the grace of God. We cannot wallow in our past, and we cannot continue to be defined by it. We have to drive a stake in the ground, as I've said before, and say, from this point forward, I'm living my life for Christ in such a way that He will be honored, and I will be a blessing to those around me. Whether they acknowledge it or not, I'll do my best to show the graciousness of God through my actions. That's when we will have begun to live again. And that text just jumps out at me because I think of where the son had been. And the shame that would have been here, how easy it would have been for the father to say, uh, 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 you walked out on me. It's an amazing portrait of the forgiveness of God and the grace of God. I'm going to ask you if you would just to kind of humor me for a little bit this morning. And I'm going to share a couple of personal things that uh, may or may not be of interest to you. So I'm just going to hope that it will be encouraging for you and we'll just leave it at that. As I've mentioned, I did not become a Christian until I was in high school. I was a sophomore in high school before I understood who Christ was, who I was outside Christ, and committed my life to Christ. That defining moment came because there were people who invested in me. The two who loved me more than anyone else on the face of the globe, my mom and dad, prayed for me. I remember the night my mom and dad committed their lives to Christ. I will never forget. I came home from work that afternoon. Our preacher came in. I've shared this with, with many of you before. He came in, sat down, and was going through a film series with my mom and dad with the gospel. He had a little movie projector. And my dad asked me to sit down and, and go through this with him. They'd been studying with him for a while. I was exhausted. I was working at a lumber yard. I was exhausted. Uh, came in, sat down, and I just promptly went to sleep. I had nothing for the preacher. It wasn't that I hated him or anything. I just, you know... He, he was a preacher, and I, I didn't really have much for him. How ironic is that? And I sat down in the chair, and I went right asleep. When I woke up, it was about midway through that presentation, which I don't know how long of a period that was, but I got up without saying a word. I got out of the chair, walked through the room, and down to my room to go to sleep. Next morning, I came up, my dad doing what my dad did every day that I remember in my life, up to the point he became a Christian, and pot of coffee and guitar at the top of the steps. I came up. My dad saying, son, I need to talk to you. And I was bracing myself. I thought, oh, here it comes. Here it comes. And dad said, son, there's going to be some changes made here. And I thought, okay, here we go. Here we go. And dad said, I want you to know, last night, your mom and I committed our lives to Christ. And I was baptized, and then I baptized your mom. And he said, uh, I want you to know we're praying for you. And that floored me. I mean, this is my dad. This is a Superman in my eyes. I mean, this is a guy, a man among men, and he's doing what women do. He's going to church. And I mean, it just floored me. And I saw a dramatic change in two very good people who weren't Christians, but I saw a dramatic change in their perspective and living from that point forward in my mom and my dad. I would not be a Christian today were it not for the indelible mark my mom and dad made on me. 
there were others who had invested in me as well. Some in the church that didn't even know who'd been praying for me. There were some who were friends kind of in a peripheral way around our preacher. And I got to tell you, that preacher became like a brother to me. We all but adopted that preacher, young preacher, first church, uh, graduate of Kentucky Christian College where I would meet my beautiful wife later, some years later. Um, wonderful Christian man that I love today. I wouldn't be a Christian were it not for some of the instruction I've received from him. Um, that whole situation just changed my entire perspective and opened the door for me to understand who I was and who Christ was. Had it not been for my mom and dad, that would have never begun. The impression a mature adult can make on the life of a young person cannot be overstated. Young people listen. Young people watch. Young people show respect and regard for what you do, good or bad, and it can make an impression on their hearts and minds in terms of their behavior. Be the good, Christ-like example. There are a few things that I learned from my mom and dad. Some things I will never forget from my mom and dad. Both of them very devoted every single day to reading their Bible. Every day. No question. That was just the way it was. My dad was a coffee drinker. My mom was a coffee drinker. Mom and dad would go through a tremendous amount of coffee before their day started and they went to work. So they were coffee drinkers. But as much as I could depend on them drinking coffee, I could depend on them even more sitting and reading their Bible. This was a big thing to them. It was a life-changing thing for them. It made an impression upon me. First Bible I ever received, after I would committed my life to Christ, I received a little Bible that, that came from the church, and I flat wore it out. I had it taped together to the point that it was falling apart, and um, my mom and dad got me my first real Bible. Still have that in my library today. I occasionally pull it out. I cannot tell you the number of people I've led to the Lord, been involved in leading to the Lord through that Bible that I've had. I've preached so many messages from it. I've taught at camps. Uh, I've done all kinds of things with that in personal Bible studies. It's been a wonderful tool for me, and I still have it, still cherish it, and I, I use that Bible, not in that particular form, but that Bible every single day because of the impression my parents made on me. That's a powerful impression. I will never forget the joy of my dad's laughter. Uh, many of you know I lost my dad a little over 30 years ago. Mom and dad were in a serious car accident. My mom survived, nearly lost her that night, but she survived. My dad did not. He was killed instantly in that accident. Uh, I've never gotten over it. Don't believe I ever will. Uh, I miss my dad every day. But I'm thankful for the hope we share. I will never forget and still often hear. There are times in my dreams I think about it, and I, I love those moments when my dad can come to me in my dreams. And I can hear my dad's laughter, and I love my dad's laughter. Now, for a portion of my life, he was not a Christian. His laughter only increased. His joy increased manifold after becoming a Christian. I can't tell you how many times sitting at my mom and dad's table hearing my mom and dad laugh when we didn't have a whole lot of provision but we had friends. We had people that would come in. The wonder of my mom and her graciousness and what she was able to do with small amounts of food to be able to multiply and provide for everybody that came unannounced and how wonderful it was. Sitting around the table telling jokes, laughing telling stories and I'll never forget the laughter of my mom Mom and dad shared and the mark that left on my life. It's a wonderful thing. I'll never forget the graciousness of my mom and dad. Came to college. I remember hearing from my dad one time. <clears throat> there was a family that was coming through our hometown. It's in the middle of winter, in the middle of a blizzard, the beginning of a blizzard, actually. And mom and dad went to the grocery to get a couple of items because they just had to, I guess. And while they were there, they saw this car. It was parked alongside the road. It was actually broken down. Windows were fogged. Dad went to the car. It turned out it'd be a family that was moving from Florida, had nothing for winter provisions. Their car was not prepared for the harsh winters of South Dakota, had frozen. The block was was shot. It was done. They had a brand new infant baby in the car. Nowhere to go. No money. They had part of a loaf of bread. That's all they had. And my dad and my mom took them home to their house. 
And he called me, not to brag about this, but just to tell me about it, just nonchalantly mentioned it. And I'm like, what? wait, what? Back up. And he's telling me this. And I said, Dad, nobody does that. You don't take a perfect stranger off the road who's come, you know, you don't do that and bring him into your house. I mean, you don't know who these people are. Well, what I do know now is those people became Christians as a result of what my mom and dad did for them. They stayed a few days and nights with my mom and dad through the blizzard. Mom and dad helped them. They were going to continue to be relocated. They were going actually to Montana. Mom and dad helped them. The church helped them to get the funds necessary to be able to be re relocated. I said Montana. It might have been Wyoming. And um, mom and dad helped them, made a great impression on them. I will never forget the graciousness of my mother and father. That's an indelible mark on my life. These are things we should pay attention to, and I know you have many of those accounts and stories as well. Those are things you should pay attention to because they make a mark on you. And if you're, you're remembering and those stories are coming back to you and you're thinking about it, let me ask you, what mark are you making on the life of another person? Is it positive? Is it Christ-like and godly? Is it a harsh word or a criticism? Is it something said that could have a negative impact on somebody? Think about it. I'm going to share something now that could probably be considered very non-conventional to folks in the church. One of my favorite stories about my dad, my wife knows this story, she's probably going to cringe when I start it. <laughs> When we were kids, we didn't have a whole lot, but one of the things we did for vacation was we went to a place called Lake Angostura. It was a long distance away from us on gravel roads in the heat, 100 plus degree temperatures of South Dakota. Mom and dad had a Pontiac station wagon with no air conditioning and six kids in the car, and it was a joyful journey, you can imagine. If you don't know what's going on here, let me tell you, if you've never been on a country dry gravel road before, it's nothing but dust. You're eating the dust for miles of people who've been in front of you and dust is coming back and if you don't have air conditioning and it's 100 plus degrees you crack the window so what happens is you have kids who start out squeaky clean in their clothes when you put them in the car and about part of the way there they're covered in what could be considered like concrete because the dust is coming in and you're sweating and it's blowing around it's going everywhere and we loved it we thought it was the greatest thing in the world when dad would open that sliding window in the back of the station wagon we didn't have seat belts back then I'm not sure what I just dropped there something <laughs> fell um, we didn't have seat belts that we used or wore back then we just thought it was great laying in the back of that station wagon looking out there wonderful vacation memories made at Lake Angostura we got there this year and dad hit the jackpot dad always looked for one of three things a source of water a shelter and near proximity to facilities I guess you could say now let me dial that back a little bit by facilities I mean outhouse Okay? We got the Lake Angostura that year, and there was a shelter house with two outhouses up on a hill, just removed from it, and a water spigot at the shelter house. It was a, an absolute win-win-win for my dad. We put our tent up next to this. We got our coolers out. We got everything all ready to go. And we were kids. We were running and doing whatever we were. We wore cutoffs. They weren't jorts then. These, this, we were cutting edge at that point. These were not jorts. They were cutoff blue jeans. And we wore no shirts, no shoes, running around my brothers and I. And I, I don't recall in the exact circumstance how long we were out, but it was plenty long enough for mom to get everything kind of gathered up, ready for us to start to eat. And we were called in to eat. And part of what we had to be able to do was we had to hose off the spigot. We also had to go up to the bathroom before we ate. This was just a part of the routine. And dad was trying to keep us entertained. He was excited about the whole situation. We're, we're walking up to these uh, porta potties. Actually, they were not porta potties. They were just wooden structures that were there like the old time outhouses. And they faced down toward the shelter house. And in the meanwhile, since we'd been out playing, several other families came because the shelter was a nice place. They came to that same area for the same reasons. There was water close by. There were toilets close by. There was shelter there that could be used. And we were all going to be sharing this space. So there's a pretty good crowd of people there right at the shore of the lake. 
and a nice summer day and cool breeze and we're barefoot in these shorts and we're walking this hill with cactus peppered all over the hillside trying to get up to this hill. So dad's helping us dodge and navigate our way up and dad's making a game out of it. You know, he's got myself and my two older brothers. I don't recall my youngest brother being with us or the girls weren't with us at that trip up the hill, but we're navigating our way between these and my dad's making a game out of it to see who can navigate without stepping on cactus and who can get to the outhouse first. And it's a long walk up the hill and he's being silly. My dad was just that way and we're all laughing and having a good time. Well, as we're getting up there, my dad's first. So my dad gets up to the outhouse, grabs the door and turns back to us to make a big deal out of it and swings the door open and yells, ta-da! And everybody down at the shelter house is looking up at this outhouse with this little man sitting inside the outhouse. And he's looking out down toward the shelter house. Now, if you can picture this in your mind, here's my dad. My dad doesn't see the man behind him. He's holding the door wide open and yelling to Daw. And my brothers and I don't care about the cactus at this point. We're laughing so hard that we're on the ground. And dad thinks he's the comedian of the year. Because I've cracked my boys up so much, he doesn't yet have any idea. And this poor guy behind him can't get his attention. Doors wide open. So my dad does the only thing he can do at that point. I'm going in first. And he turns and hello. <laughs> and he's holding the door open. And my dad's, I swear to you, the first words out of his mouth. Boy, it's a pretty day, isn't it? <laughs> and that poor fella. I swear this is true. I promise this is true. That poor fella, vulnerable as he was, said, it's a beautiful day. Would you mind please closing that door? <laughs> so my dad politely closed the door. Now, here's the thing that is also interesting about my dad. My dad was an extrovert, and it killed me as a kid because I was so inverted. I didn't want to talk to people. I was so shy and so backward, and my dad was an extrovert, and he loved everybody. He shook everybody's hand in a two-fisted way. He would hug perfect strangers. He brought people from the grocery, broken down on the road to his house. That was my dad, okay? And mom was a lot the same way. I wasn't. I was very shy shy. So dad did the only thing in this opportunity to kind of redeem himself as an extrovert. And he stood outside the outhouse and talked to the man <laughs> until the man decided it was time to leave with whatever dignity he had remaining the outhouse. Now here's the other thing that's kind of killing. That made a big impression on me. I'm sure it made a big impression on that man too. I'm sure that for a long time people at the shelter house talked to everybody else. Remember that time that crazy guy went up there and opened that outhouse door? I'll bet Bet you nobody went in that outhouse without using that little metal latch on the inside ever after that. That made a big impression on me for a lot of reasons. As silly and goofy as it was, dad was just that kind of uh, over-the-top sort of fun-loving guy. He was fun to be around. Mom, in complimentary ways, the same way. Loved, loved people. And they showed that, and it's made an impression on me. Listen, I'm going to tell you flatly, I would not do what I'm doing now if I didn't love people. I wouldn't. There are other things I can do. And there are times when it's, it's more challenging in circumstances because people do things and you can see the train wreck coming and you try to advise, you try to tell them differently and they still head down that path headlong, hard and fast. And I have to draw deep and I have to call myself back to those opportunities where I'm able to say, my dad, even before he was a Christian, but especially after he became a Christian, my dad and my mom both loved people so much because they valued, they saw the value in people and and that's a tremendous impression left on my life as a result of this. I remember talking to my brothers after this. Years and years later. It's been only a few years ago. We'd gathered together and we were talking. And we were sharing stories about dad. And all of us had all these different stories about growing up. And things that mom and dad did for us. And things that, that uh, were, were pertinent to us after we lost our dad. And kind of remembering those things. And I brought up that story, which I refer to as the Tada story. And one of my older brothers looked at me and said, man, I forgot about that. And I'm thinking, how can you forget about, I mean, I could see that poor guy with post-traumatic trauma <laughs> forgetting it, you know, trembling every time he goes near an outhouse. But anybody else would remember that. 
I think about the impression my mom has made through the course of her life of faith. My dad would not be a Christian were it not for my mom. And my dad had a, a big impression upon me, my mom as well, in terms of my becoming a Christian. But dad would have never come to Christ had it not been for my mom. Ladies, I don't want you to ever underestimate the influence that you can have as a godly woman in the heart and the mind of your spouse. Because you do bear an impression. And sometimes, maybe we're not so good about telling you or showing you, but your views do matter. Your opinions do matter. Your life, your integrity, it does matter and it bears an impression on us. Mom helped to bring my dad to a place where he could hear the gospel and respond to Christ. That's a powerful statement that's made. Mom showed in so many ways her love for the Lord. I think about in Scripture the ways that we're reminded of the blessings God has given us, children being one of them. In Psalm 128, the first six verses I'm going to read in just a moment, it underscores the reality of the family unit and the value of and, and the, the meaning of children and their blessing. My mom never, I don't ever, and I'm being very honest here, I don't ever remember a single time in my life that my mom ever made me feel like I was less than valued by her. Now maybe you've not had that experience in your life. I'm blessed in that way. But my mom understood the blessing of children. Our culture, to a large extent, has the idea that kids are an obstacle. There's a trend today for families not to have kids. And it's not that they're unable. Some are unable. And I get that. I understand that. You know, um, Rita and I were told we'd never have children. So I, I understand that. But there are some who choose not to have children because they view children as an obstacle. That's not the way the Bible presents children to us. Children are a blessing. In Psalm 128, verses 1 through 6, the scripture says, How blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. When you shall eat of the fruit of your hands, you'll be happy and it will be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children like olive plants around your table. A bunch of kids. Behold, for thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. This is something God wants for you to be able to experience. The Lord bless you from Zion, and may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Indeed, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. I've shared this before. Love our son. Love him deeply. My grandbabies are precious. And I love my son more now because of my grandbabies. They're an extension of him, an extension of the Lord's blessing to me. I'm so thankful for the way the Lord has blessed in that way. Mom never made us feel like we were less than cherished or valued. What a powerful impression. Let me ask you, in the moments of frustration, when you've got a thousand questions and you've got kids hovering around you, I understand the, the frustration and the anxiety that can be created by a lot of environments, but are you showing in your response to your children, to your grandchildren, or to those around you that you cherish them? It makes a difference. Because I'm going to tell you, this world doesn't value anybody. They value what you can do for them, but they do not value you for who you are. God values you for who you are. We sing the song, Just As I Am, because he receives us as we are, knowing who we are, so that he can help to change us to be who we ought to be, who we are intended to be. Scripture is quite clear with regard to the example that we bear, and parents have a unique opportunity, especially to have a tremendous spiritual impact on the hearts and minds of their children. Romans chapter 12 speaks in general with regard to how we as mature adults are to interact with others. Verses 9 and following says, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate 
with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. I mentioned my mom. And one of the things that makes a powerful, a great impression upon me is how she interacted with the immediate kids in our family. Mom and dad both came from horrible, broken environments of relationship. Dad had a daughter. Mom had two boys, young. Mom and dad met. They married. Later in life became Christians. Uh, the family, of course, grew through the meanwhile. And I think about that. You know, they were growing up in harsh times. Six kids in one household. The seventh wasn't with us being raised. But eight people in a house coming up through an economy that was crushing, awful, gas lines, and all that, all that kind of mess. And they were able to be gracious throughout all of it. You know, for a long time, I thought my mom's favorite piece of chicken was the neck. I actually believed that for such a long time. And then I realized that my mom took that because she didn't want somebody else to have to take it. It was just the piece that was left. That's what she was going to eat. Mom made do with what she had. That's still my mom today. She does so many things within the church environment, within her circle of friends and so many others. And mom is now 78. Uh, is in great health, strong as a horse. Um, and my sweet, beautiful mother still serving people, still doing for people, still even in times when perhaps her provision is a little bit wanting. And she's doing everything she can to help make sure someone else's need is met. Giving preference to someone over herself. What an impression that makes. Listen, in that sense... I can relate to what the father said about the first son. I'm only beginning to live. I'm only starting. Because I've got a lot to learn, a lot to grow in terms of my graciousness, in terms of my love of people, in terms of my response and joy, in terms of how I respond in circumstances of adversity. But you see, I've had two very powerful influences in my life, just in my direct, immediate influence that have made such a difference for me. Who is within your circle of influence the Lord wants you to make an impression upon? You see, living for Christ really demands. It requires that we pass along. We create a legacy of faithfulness. And that doesn't mean we have the expectation of our kids being faithful. It means we expect and are faithful. Because you see, we're accountable for ourselves. The question is, in training up a child, for the adults in the crowd, the mature adults, what are we doing with regard to resources, time, energy, effort, model, investment? What are we doing with what we've been entrusted to care over to make a positive impression for those who are coming after us? That's a responsibility the Lord's placed on our shoulders. It's not beyond our ability to reach and fulfill it. The question is, are we? Let's take a moment together. Let's have a closing prayer. Father, thank you for giving us this privileged opportunity to be in your presence here today. And we recognize, Lord, that we don't depart from your presence, even in circumstances where we're outside this building and living in our normal daily, everyday life. But in this unique environment, we're gathered here in faith, together, cooperatively, in like faith. We're here collectively to learn from your scripture and the example you've given us through Christ. We're here to spur one another on, to help meet each other's needs, and to give you honor. So we pray you do your work in us. Help us, Lord, to reflect in terms of what your scripture has shown, in terms of the expectation you have with regard to how we should interact with others and the opportunity of impression, which we've been given unique to others who are around us. Help us to take advantage of those opportunities to make the greatest impression we can for Christ. May you guide and direct us so that in everything we'll be able to give you honor. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me this morning. We're going to use this very familiar song as a song for a time of reflection and a time just to kind of consider where we are with regard to Christ and his lordship in our life. If you have questions about what it means to be a Christian or what God expects of you in terms of service and faithful living, what it means to be a, a member of this congregation, if you have questions about those things, I would love to talk with you about that. And uh, we could set up an opportunity to do just that. I'd encourage you to consider 
those questions today as we sing together this morning. Let's sing, I Surrender All. portion of the service and I neglected to do so. If you would like to observe the Lord's Supper with us this morning and to participate in this time we're about to share, then we have around the perimeter of the room here uh, little kits for communion. You can pick one of those up and have them and uh, have them in preparation and readiness for what we're about to do this morning. <laughs> I'd like to read this morning from a text of Scripture that's very familiar to many of us. It comes from the writings of the Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit provides, through Paul, a reflection of how uh, the, the Lord implemented the Lord's Supper. And there are some key points here that we try to pay attention to as we observe this together. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following, the Scripture says this, as Paul writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That text identifies a few things for us. Scripture tells us that Jesus in the Gospels gathered with his disciples to observe the Passover meal. They used special emblems which had special purpose during the meal. One of the emblems Jesus used for the Lord's Supper was unleavened bread. Bread that was made in haste for a journey, a trip. Bread which spiritually would represent the lack of sin, the lack of something that would corrupt or, or cause it to be defiled. And Jesus used that bread as a reminder of his body. That simple bread, which we have each Sunday, carries a tremendous reminder for us. It tells us of the sacrifice Jesus paid for our sin to be removed. He, in fact, unleavened, sinless, didn't have to die. But he chose to die. The Bible says he was slain before the foundations of the earth. That tells us that Jesus had established already that he would be the sacrifice because he was the only one sufficient to be able in a sinless way to redeem us from our sin. That bread, small and simple as it is, reminds us of the body of Christ. There was a cup that was used as well that night. And the Bible speaks of Jesus using that cup and paralleling it as a reminder for us of His shed blood. It wasn't spilled by accident. It was poured out on purpose. It was shed. It was given. And the Bible says that, sin, that blood is able to blot out, to cover, to pay for our sin. 
This morning as we come together, we fulfill what the scripture speaks here in saying, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That word until is very powerful. That's why we observe this every Lord's day. It allows for us an understanding. The word until means in a consistent, ongoing method for a specific time frame. It is to continue until the Lord returns. We remember, and then in His presence, in the words of the Lord, it will be renewed. This is a good indicator for us in our time of remembrance today, and it's why we offer the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day. The model of the New Testament church, the early church, the first century, was doing this on every Lord's Day, and we do the best we can to do the same. But we're called to remember His broken body as we take the bread, and His shed blood as we observe the cup. I would encourage you to do just that. To be able to remember the sacrifice of Christ and to consider your value for such a sacrifice to be paid to redeem you. Let's pray together. Fathers, we consider from your scriptures the incredible richness of your grace, the abundance of love you've shown us in the willingness of Jesus to pay our debt. We're humbled by the reality of who we are in terms of what you've done for us. Outside Christ, the scriptures teach us that we are an enemy. Outside Christ, we're told that we are stained with sin in a way which cannot be changed apart from the blood of Jesus. Outside Christ, we're told that we are estranged from you, we're foreign, we're alien, and we can do nothing to approach you. But because of what Jesus has done, as we remember today, you've afforded for us forgiveness. His blood has blotted out our sin. His debt uh, paid in full uh, for, for our sin debt. That death is one that was not deserved. And because of it, your scriptures teach us that you have given him the ability to rise from the dead, never to die again. We long for the day to be reunited with you in that opportunity of resurrection. In the meanwhile, Father, we consider who we are and we consider what you've done. We ask your blessing upon this bread as it reminds us of the broken body of Jesus and upon this cup as it reminds us of the shed blood that he poured out to remove our sin. May you bless this observation and our remembrance today so that we can honor you in our living and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. that you were here with us today and I certainly trust that you've been encouraged by the things we've talked about and the opportunity you've had to interact with others of like faith. Again, I want to say if you have questions about our fellowship, what we teach, uh, what we hold to as, as doctrine, what we practice, if you have questions about what it means to be a Christian and how to become a Christian, we'd love to have that conversation with you. Please come talk to me. I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me together. We're going to have a closing prayer. And then we're going to sing a closing chorus. Rita and I are going to make our way to the door as, as you all sing. And we just look forward to being able to, to greet you as you begin your week now uh, with a word of encouragement from the Lord. So let's have a prayer and then we'll sing together. All hail King Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for the opportunity of refreshing that comes from your word, the opportunity of remembrance as we consider the sacrifice of Jesus and the difference it's made for us. May you spur us on through your word and spirit so that we can be even greater servants for you. Give us 
eyes to see the needs of others. Give us a heart of compassion and strength to be able to rise to meet those needs. And Father, we pray where we fail, you'd offer grace and forgiveness, that you'd help our hearts to be broken so that we can be led back to you in a way that would honor you. May you bless this assembly as we leave this place. Help us to walk in your presence faithfully. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.